Welcome everyone. My name is Renee Ketchum and I'm thrilled to welcome you to One Film, One Federation, our festival on Jean-Pierre Melville. Today we're going to talk about Léon Morin, Prêtre. Un grand merci to our sponsors for this wonderful event, France Today and Bonjour Paris. AFUSA is the largest Alliance Francaise network in the world, helping 24,000, 25,000 learners of French each year learn French, live French, and love French at the Alliance Francaise. We have some wonderful national events coming up, including Cassoulet Confections, Proust versus Colette, another um, Jean-Pierre Melville uh, program in November on Le Cercle Rouge, Sarah Bernhardt, and How to Retire in France with Adrian Leeds. So visit AFUSA.org for these wonderful programs. A few logistics, please stay on mute during the presentation, stay on speaker view. All questions should be put in the chat that we will talk about at the end of the program in the last 15 minutes. And if you have any technical issues, sign back in after a couple of minutes using the original link. This event is being recorded for our YouTube channel and the total runtime is one hour. So today I'd like to introduce Rémi Grombach, Vice President of the Jean-Pierre Melville Foundation. Rémi is a famous French director and producer known for Les Rendez-vous du Dimanche, a weekly TV show he directed for 10 years, and that was presented by star host Michel Drucker. Rémi also directed Avis de Recherche and Le Jeu de la Varité, presented by Patrick Sabatier. Rémi Gumbach directed many special awards TV shows, such as the prestigious Victoire de la Musique, Molière, the Cannes Film Festival, Midam, or Set d'Or Cérémonie. In 1980, Rémi Gumbach became a SACEM, such a member, member of the Director's Commission since 1984. He was president of the organization from 2000 to 2003. Since then, he has been one of the company's administrators. Among the many awards he received, received during his career, Rami was recipient of the Audiovisual Author Director Grand Prix in 2006. Peter de Bruges is the chief film critic at Variety. Peter is, again, as I just said, chief film critic for Variety, where he has worked since 2005, including a two-year stint in Paris, where he focused on covering the international festival circuit. Peter is the recipient of the 2018 Prix Alliance Française de Los Angeles and has been awarded the rank of Chevalier in the Ordre des Arts et des Lettres. He is an honorary member of the Jean-Pierre Melville Foundation. So we welcome everyone today to talk about Léon Morin Prêtre. So welcome, Peter. Welcome, Rémi. And Ellen Sauchek will translate for Rémi. Merci. Can you hear me? Yes, Just, we can. Uh, okay, great. <laughs> sure, uh, Peter. So uh, uh, today we're discussing Léon Morin. Hello, Rémi. Uh, the, um, uh, and uh, Melville is personally my favorite filmmaker. And I think I want to sort of uh, dig in a little bit uh, before we get too specific about the movie, talking about Melville and what really sets him apart for those of us who are joining him. Uh, the If this were a live audience, I would ask for a show of hands who have uh, seen other films by Melville, uh, but uh, we'll uh, uh, we'll presume that um, a little bit of introduction might be beneficial. Um, Remy, uh, tell us a little bit um, in in your view. What do you think sort of set uh, Melville apart from his peers? Uh, he was sort of an outsider who created his own path into the French uh, film industry. Peter, tu peux me reposer la question en français, s'il te plaît. Oui, en français, j'ai demandé, c'est quoi qui a un peu défini uh, Melville? Il était différent que, que, que les autres réalisateurs, dans le sens qu'il était un peu uh, sur, le, sur les marges. Uh, il a construit son propre chemin pour entrer dans l'industrie. Oui, il a été... Ça a été prouvé par la nouvelle vague après qu'il a essayé, qu'il a admiré parce que il était complètement c'était une... quand Jean-Pierre a commencé le à faire du cinéma il était complètement en marge des professionnels de l'époque 
il y avait des règles presque absolues en France pour être metteur en scène, avoir fait soit l'IDEC, soit des cours, euh, faire partie d'une association. Et Jean-Pierre était complètement en marge. C'était un homme libre et qui était... Euh, euh, qui s'est introduit dans le métier, si on peut dire. Euh, il avait, dans sa jeunesse, c'était un fou de cinéma, et quand il faisait ses études, ses parents, c'est-à-dire mes grands-parents, à vrai dire, croyaient qu'il allait euh, à l'école, à vrai dire, il allait voir toutes les séances. En France, à l'époque, il y avait des cinémas qui commençaient à 10 heures du, mat 10 heures du matin. Et Jean-Pierre, lui, à partir de 10 heures, jusqu'au soir, euh, presque 10 heures, parce qu'il fallait qu'il rentre chez lui, il était au cinéma. C'est-à-dire que la culture de Jean-Pierre, c'est une culture totalement cinématographique, jusqu'à ce qu'il découvre le cinéma américain. Et alors là, plus aucun cinéma, pour ainsi dire, n'a eu de valeur à ses yeux. Il a complètement intégré le cinéma américain, absorbé le cinéma américain, ça a été un émule total du cinéma américain. Jean-Pierre était un fou du cinéma américain. Il a découvert l'Amérique à travers le cinéma américain. Et quand il était aux États-Unis, la première chose qu'il a voulu faire, c'est aller dans des lieux où, qui étaient les caractéristiques de certains films. Ce n'est pas du tout... Un, on ne peut pas dire que ce soit un, un visiteur normal. Il était le visiteur du cinéma américain. Et euh, il nous a enchanté, mon cousin et moi, Laurent n'est pas là ce soir, mais il nous a enchanté en nous racontant le cinéma américain, en nous le faisant vivre. Yes, I, um, excuse me. <coughs> J'étais un peu long peut-être. Non, non, j'ai juste, juste, pardon. Yes, he was actually a predecessor of the Nouvelle Vague, and um, he was really somebody who was marginalized for a large part of the beginning of his career. And it was a time when in French cinema, there were rules, and these rules were absolute rules. You had to follow them in order to succeed. And most of them involved, uh, you had to have either uh, attended IDEC or taken courses or belonged to professional associations. You had to have made films and progressed along the way along this predefined route. And uh, Jean-Pierre did not do any of that. He really created himself as he made his cinema. And he was, absolutely crazy about cinema. He loved it. And his parents, when they would send him off to school in the morning, at that time, movie theaters would have um, would have screenings beginning at 10 o'clock in the morning. And his parents would send him off to school and they would think that he was at school when in fact he would go to the movie theater and be there from 10 o'clock in the morning until almost 10 o'clock at night when he absolutely had to go home. So he really lived in the cinema, his culture was 100% cinematographic. And one of the things that he became very enamored of was American cinema. He was introduced to it. He, he, he saw as many American films as he could. And he really integrated American film aesthetics and American style into his own work. And he was absolutely crazy about it. And One of the things that he he did was he really discovered America via American cinema so that when he actually came to the United States, he was quite different from the typical tourist. Um, the places where he wanted to go were all of the places that he had seen in the various films that that, that were important to him. And so this was something that that he he really was was crazy about and he passed this on to my cousin Laurent who's not here today and me and he gave us this idea and and transmitted this this love for american cinema as well il disait excuse-moi peter excuse-moi jean-pierre oui. disait mes réalisateurs préférés sont 60 et ce sont 60 américains I have, uh, what he said was, I have um, 60 favorite filmmakers and all 60 are American. This is one of the things I find really interesting about Melville because he had such uh, an appreciation for what I think we would now think of as classic Hollywood. Uh, it's sort of the, the, the 30s and 40s American filmmakers. 
And he continued in a way, he modeled his own uh, style, his own language, his own aesthetic around this American, uh, the, the kind of uh, foundational American directors. Uh, and, uh, and yet he brought his own sensibility, both a French philosophy, but also one crafted or one shaped by his own life experience. He had fought in the war. He had participated in the occupation. He had uh, friends on both sides of the law. And many of his films are about uh, crime and, and look at both the police and the criminal sides. And all of these things he brought personally to it. So he kind of processed this American aesthetic through a French filter, through a personal filter, projected it back on the screen. And in a way, I think of it as an improvement on those directors and those films from that era. Uh, so that, as a film critic, is kind of what excites me about Melville. Now, today's film, Léon Morin, is uh, in some ways exceptional. It's different. It's not like the other films in Melville's oeuvre. And I'd like to talk to you, Remy, about uh, to what extent you can inform us how this project came to be. It's based on a novel. Why do you think uh, Jean-Pierre wanted to make Léon Morin? C'était, je crois que quand il a fait Léon Morin, de toute façon, il adorait l'auteur. D'une part, il avait lu, il avait le bouquin chez lui. Moi, j'avais vu le bouquin bien avant qu'il fasse le film, mais en plus, pour lui, c'était un double défi, parce qu'il prenait un acteur qui était à l'encontre même, à l'inverse du personnage, c'est-à-dire un acteur très moderne qui s'était fait connaître à travers un film de Godard et qui était Belmondo. Et personne n'aurait pu imaginer que Belmondo puisse interpréter Léon Morin. C'était un défi, c'est un double défi de deux hommes. D'une part, de Jean-Pierre, qui façonnait le personnage de Léon Morin à travers l'acteur, et d'autre part, de Ben Mondo, qui n'était pas du tout le personnage de Léon Morin. Well, first of all, he really loved the author, and he had the book. I know he had read the book, and I had seen the book in his home long before he, he embarked on the project. And I think one of the reasons why he wanted to do it was it really represented a double kind, a kind of double challenge for him. The first part of the challenge was he was being asked to cast, to portray a character and cast an actor who was totally against type um, to play that particular character. And it was a double challenge because it was not only the ch challenge for Jean-Pierre, but it was also the challenge for Belmondo as well to play a character who was so different from who he was. Pardon me. This was the beginning of a of a collaboration between Melville and Belmondo, which lasted three films. And uh, you can look at Melville's career, and you can see these chapters in which he had, uh, you know, a movie star that he would collaborate with on a number of films. And then often, what would happen is because Melville was a strong personality, he would uh, fall out with that uh, uh, kind of. Uh, that uh, connection would uh, would break down because of the the way that their personalities would butt up against each other. My understanding, Remy, if we were to jump from this first collaboration to the end of it, I'm pretty sure it ended up with Belmondo giving Melville a punch in the nose. Is that right? J'ai pas compris la question. Est-ce qu'on peut la traduire en français? La connexion entre Belmondo et Melville. C'est terminé dans, quand il s'est bat, battu euh, et c'était Belmondo qui a défendu un de ses euh, collègues, je crois, euh, oui, de Jean-Pierre. Ils ne se sont pas vraiment battus parce que moi, j'ai assisté. J'étais très jeune, j'étais oui. stagiaire pour la première fois avec mon oncle. Et je n'ai jamais été son assistant, mais j'étais stagiaire chez lui. C'est-à-dire que l'acteur qui a défendu Belmondo était le doyen des acteurs français qui s'appelait Charles Vanel, qui était un très grand acteur, très bon acteur, et qui avait tourné énormément avec Clouseau. Et 
euh, Jean-Pierre n'a pas frappé Vanel, mais il lui a envoyé une sorte de coup au-dessus du visage qui a renversé son chapeau. Et Belmondo, à ce moment-là, Melville avait toujours son énorme chapeau, a frappé le chapeau de Melville et s'est jeté sur Melville. Mais manque de peau, j'y étais donc. Je vous raconte l'exacte vérité. Manque de peau, Melville, c'était un mec qui faisait 1m82, c'était un mec qui, mesure, qui pesait 90 kilos, et quand Belmondo s'est jeté sur lui, d'une pichinette, Melville l'a renversé. Et Mel Belmondo en a été complètement euh, aigri. Et ils se sont fâchés. Mais dites-vous bien que Jean-Pierre a toujours pris, pour faire des rôles intéressants, les acteurs qu'il admirait. Mais il s'est toujours, à la fin, fâché avec les acteurs qu'il admirait. Moi, j'ai travaillé avec euh, Jean-Paul, évidemment, avec Ben Mondo. J'ai travaillé avec Lino Ventura. Et ils m'ont tous raconté que ça s'est toujours tout terminé mal. Euh, pour la bonne raison que Jean-Pierre estimait que le metteur en scène d'un film, c'était le personnage principal du film. C'est lui qui avait tous les ressorts en main, c'est lui qui dirigeait, c'est lui qui décidait, c'est lui qui ordonnait. Et malheureusement, ou faut, fort heureusement pour lui, mais malheureusement, à l'inverse, il tombait sur des vedettes énormes qui avaient du mal à supporter l'autorité, qui avaient du mal à supporter les conseils et qui avaient du mal à supporter l'intransigeance de Melville. Um, actually, that, that particular incident that you were describing, um, I was present then. I never was the assistant to my uncle, but in this particular time, I was uh, uh, an intern on the, on the set. And so I was present when this, this incident took place. And it wasn't exactly that he punched him in the nose, but there was an actor who was... Um, who was being, uh, who was part of the, the cast, uh, a very well-known, the dean of actors in, in French cinema, Charles Vanel. And Charles Vanel had a hat on. And at one point, um, it, it happened that um, Belmondo actually hit into, um, or hit into um, Vanel and Vanel's, no, I'm sorry, Melville hit into um, uh, Vanel and his hat came off. And Belmondo thought that it was that he had actually done this deliberately. And so he turned around and Jean-Pierre always wore a large hat himself. And so he then hit his hat off his head. And so it was this way that they sort of had this, this misunderstanding and, and um, it wasn't really quite the, the punch in the nose that you described, but um, it was something that was um, kind of, Uh, typical of what would happen oftentimes when he would work with an actor um, the actors that he chose were always actors whom he admired and he admired them very often because they were strong-willed and because they had this kind of star quality but what would happen is that he was He, it would eventually end badly for, for the actors and Melville together. So, for example, with um, Belmondo and then also with Lino Ventura, who came after, um, uh, in the end, they ended up not, you know, not on good terms. And um, I think part of the reason why is that Jean-Pierre had a very strong idea of what the role of the director was. The director was the main, the principal person on every set. He was the one who did the directing. He was the one who did the deciding. And he was the one who would issue orders. And he really wanted the actors who were performing in his, in acting in his films to, to accept that. And because he would Unfortunately, because he would often choose these very strong-willed um, stars who were who had their own opinions, um, these opinions very often were not the same, and they were not always willing to accept his authority or to accept his advice. And so that really set them up for the kind of conflict that happened in their relationships. Il faut pas oublier que Jean-Pierre avait à peu près 19 ans ou 20 ans au début de la guerre de 40 et qu'il a fait 
six ans de guerre. C'est-à-dire que mes grands-parents ne l'ont pas vu, ne savaient pas ce qu'il était devenu. Ils ne savaient pas qu'il s'était battu, que c'était un guerrier et que c'était à la limite un héros. Et quand Jean-Pierre est revenu, il ne comprenait pas très bien ce qu'était devenu la France. Et il avait du mal à comprendre. Et en plus, c'est un homme qui pardonnait facilement, malgré son côté bravache, son côté dur. Il avait tendance à pardonner. Et donc, il trouvait que les... Un exemple. Quand Jean-Pierre a tourné euh, Bob le flambeur, il est allé chercher à la prison de Fresnes un homme qui avait été enfermé pour collaboration, qui était Roger Duchesne. Et il lui a donné le rôle principal de son film. Et personne dans ma famille, et personne autour dans le milieu, n'a compris pourquoi il prenait Roger Duchesne. Et je ne sais même pas si lui pouvait se l'expliquer. Et c'était peut-être par esprit de contradiction, par bravache, je ne sais pas. Mais enfin, Jean-Pierre était un être... Euh, Jean-Pierre disait qu'il avait horreur du mensonge et il rajoutait et le mensonge est à l'origine de toutes les vérités et le mensonge c'est la définition c'est la définition même du cinéma I, I wanted to add that it's very important to remember that at the beginning of the war Jean-Pierre was 19, 20 years old and he actually went off to fight in the war and was gone for six years. And following his six years of war, his during that time, his his parents, my uh, my grandparents, um, really had no idea of was he alive, was he dead, what was happening, what had happened to him. And when he came back after the war, it was very hard for him to accept what had happened to France in the time when he was absent, when he was away at the war, and what France had become during that period of time. But one of his characteristics was, although he had these very strong opinions, he was also someone who forgave easily. And I'll give you an example of, of that. Um, when he was casting the, the lead for Bob Le Flambeur, the actor that he that he chose was a man named uh, Roger Duchesne. And Roger was in prison for having been a collaborator during the war. And Jean-Pierre went and went to the prison and fetched him and got him out so that he would be able to then act in Bob Le Flambeur. And none of his family or his, his friends understood why he wanted to hire somebody like that to do it. And in a way, he said he didn't really know himself 100% sure why he did it. It could have been because of just wanting to do something contradictory or to really do something that was almost like an act of bravado. But um, but he did he did he did hire him, and the one thing that was very important for Melville was he had a horror of lies. He did not like lies, and yet he believed that lies were really what were at the foundation of all cinema. I uh, I I'd like to come back to the film in a in a moment, but I I like that we're sort of establishing a bit this uh, director whose personality is really. It's larger than life. It's constructed. It's you know. It's something he kind of assumed, and uh, and it kind of I think gives an insight into this uh, this uh, incredible career he had. So just to you know linger maybe one more question here or you know discussion point to to picture Melville, who assumed the name himself. Uh, you know he adopted the name during the war who uh, kind of the thing that we were talking about with the hat, I mean, he had kind of as an extension of his appreciation for American cinema and American culture, he uh, wore a Stetson hat. He wore, uh, you know, uh, kind of like aviator glasses. He drove an open, you know, a convertible Cadillac around the streets of Paris. You know, when we get to Bob Le Flambeur later in this series, you'll see that Bob also sort of, you know, kind of has a bit of this uh, Melvillian persona, but this is not someone who would have blended in with French people, with French directors. He really created kind of an image of himself. And I think, you know, that ties back into where we are here in his career, because in these early films, he's making some very interesting movies 
that are much harder if you're looking at it from this sort of auteur theory, where it's about, you know, kind of looking at a director and understanding kind of the common uh, philosophy and vision he has in his films that is there. But in a way, it's they're interesting clues because he chooses the projects early in his career very deliberately. And yet uh, they uh, they are not as there is a narrower channel later in, in his career that's focused on on uh, war and uh, crime films. But Léon Morin and uh, also Le Silence de la Mer, uh, the uh, uh, the Cocteau uh, um, uh, film that he had made just before. Uh, sorry, Les Enfants. Uh, uh, I'm forgetting. Les uh, Enfants Terribles. That's right, Les Enfants Terribles. Uh, you know, these show, I think, in a way, a, a, a broader vision of Melville's uh, interests. Um, but uh, Remy, can you help kind of uh, do kind of a resume, a summary of this early period of uh, Melville's career? I think Léon Marin is kind of the last of these films that is they're more dramas. They're based on literature. They uh, they're in some ways more. Uh, in keeping with what French cinema was doing and kind of doing his own version or response to what uh, the industrial cinema was doing. But uh, here I'm asking maybe if you can give your understanding of what the first half dozen films in Melville's career represent, you know, before he sort of really uh, focuses almost exclusively on crime cinema after that. Je pas très bien compris le début de la question. Dans un sens, je cherche une explication de ce l'inspiration, le, le, le motivation des films tôt dans la carrière de Melville, parce que je pense qu'il y a, c'est un peu, Léon Morin, c'est un peu le dernier d'un cycle des oui, films. D'une certaine, certaine époque. Oui, c'est ça. Oui, Et c'est pour mieux comprendre. Oui, oui, tout à fait, je suis d'accord. C'est la, la fin d'une époque de Melville. Après, il était beaucoup plus, au départ, Melville est beaucoup plus littéraire dans son cinéma qu'il ne l'a été ensuite. C'est-à-dire que Melville avait comme... Euh... Moi, je me souviens des bouquins qu'il y avait dans sa chambre. C'était des bouquins de Cocteau, c'était les bouquins de Kessel, c'était les bouquins de Druon, c'était... Melville était très littéraire. Et il a fait un cinéma beaucoup plus littéraire au début. Et petit à petit, son cinéma a bifurqué vers un côté beaucoup plus... Euh, comment dire Beaucoup plus d'action. C'est-à-dire que si, si on résume bien, si on se projette dans ce qu'aurait fait Melville après, je pense que Melville aurait fait des séries policières. J'en suis à peu près persuadé. D'abord parce qu'il adorait la télévision. Il était, il était certain que la télévision boufferait le cinéma. Ça lui faisait peur, mais ça l'enthousiasmait en même temps. Oui. Et je pense qu'il aurait fini comme, euh, comme réalisateur de télévision. Enfin, qu'il aurait travaillé... Michael Mann... Pour... Euh, de son époque. <rire> oui, absolument. Comme, comme une partie des... À l'inverse de certains cinéastes américains qui ont commencé par la télévision pour finir par le cinéma, je pense que Melville avait commencé par le cinéma et aurait fini à la télévision. Mm. Parce qu'il était euh, absolument euh, ahuri et absolument euh, craintif de du pouvoir qu'avait la télévision et il m'avait moi il m'avait dit il avait dit à mon cousin souvent la télévision bouffera le cinéma. Um, I agree with with what you said very much. Um, this really was this film really did mark the end of an era. Um, I think from the start at the start of his career he really was a much more literary kind of director, 
And I remember um, in his home, in his in his library, um, the books that he had, they were Cocteau, they were Cassell, um, and and all of the 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 really classic books that that were important at the time. But little by little, his cinema really started to branch off from that. And instead of of being literary, they really tended more towards the action film. And I think that if you project, if if we could project forward and think that if Melville were were living now, um, it, would he have continued in that same vein, or would he have gone towards television? And I think the answer would have been he would have become a, a TV director, uh, probably of police series because they were the kinds of stories that he really liked. But he also had both a respect and also a fear of the power of what television could do. And I think that he really wanted to, to be part of it so that there was some control over that. And so um, uh, in the future, that may have been what it, that might have been what he would have done had he been living now. And in a way, his career is sort of the reverse of what it is for many directors, because oftentimes you have people who directors who began as directors of TV series. And then as they developed as directors, they moved on to cinema. In his case, I think it would have been exactly the reverse. It would have been someone who had started in cinema and then worked their way um, towards television. Uh, great. Well, let, let's dig into Leo Morin. I also want to remind those who are listening, we invite your questions as well. Please put them in the chat and we'll try and incorporate any specific points that you have questions about. Um, I noticed that Phyllis was raising her hand and I didn't know if that was because she had a question or maybe something else, but it's a reminder. We'd love to incorporate any specific inquiries you have in the minutes ahead, but um, we still have half an hour. And it, I'd like to talk about Leon Morin because I believe this is one of the great films about faith and religion that cinema has, but I don't know. I mean, it's about questioning those things. And of course, you know, there's the, the duty that um, uh, Belmondo's priest character has to his beliefs and the way that that is challenged by meeting uh, Emmanuel Riva and the and the you know kind of uh, romantic uh, dilemma that poses. Remy was Jean Pierre a believer? Was he Christian? Was he agnostic? Was he um, an atheist? Uh, what is your understanding of his relationship to uh, to God? Je pense que Jean Pierre était athée. Je pense. Euh, les relations qu'il avait avec Dieu, je pense qu'il avait, enfin, à propos de Dieu, c'est qu'il se prenait pour Dieu dans son métier. Il pensait qu'il était, euh, qu était le Dieu du métier. Jean-Pierre avait une très haute estime de lui-même dans le métier. <rire> oui, je sais, ça paraît, c'est dur de dire ça, mais c'est vrai. Et euh, quand on disait qu'il était euh, quand on faisait la liste de ses réalisateurs préférés moi je me souviens enfin, de l'entendre dire ma, ma liste elle est simple c'est 60 réalisateurs ils sont tous américains car euh, la nouvelle vague ne m'intéresse pas euh, la nouvelle vague aurait voulu qu'il soit le parrain de la nouvelle vague il leur avait dit surtout pas je n'ai rien à voir avec vous. Et il disait, en se marrant, je suis peut-être le 61e cinéaste américain. I, I believe that he was an atheist. Um, um, and as far as his relationship with God is concerned, he really believed that he was God when he was on, the, when he was doing his job, when he was on the set, when he was directing. Um, he was somebody who had very high self-esteem, um, and um, I, I may, it may be a little hard to say this, but um, he really did consider himself when he was doing his his work and in his field that he was the god of his 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 chosen field, and he would often say that you know he had uh, if, if he talked about his list of favorite directors. He would often say that on his list of favorite directors, um, 60 of those direct, there were 60 favorite directors and they were all American. 
well, why was that? Well, because what was going on in French cinema at the time, even with the, the Nouvelle Vague, he, it was something that was parallel to to the time to the to his work, but it really didn't interest him. He really wasn't part of that. He was still really someone whose work was set apart, and he would often say that if there was a sixty first person uh, on that list of 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 directors, it would have been him himself. You know, I I wish I could get my hands on this list, and it might be available in in some interviews or some places. But my understanding is that this list of directors, the way Melville thought of filmmakers was to make his pantheon. It was not that you had to make only masterpieces. It was that you had to make one masterpiece, and by making a film that he considered perfect. You know that so each of the directors they may have had multiple ones but each of the directors was there because there was a film of theirs that he had just uh you know been blown away by in the cinema impressed you know and put in his pantheon but it, you know i'm so curious to know because of these influences of american cinema and every once in a while you can see him pay direct homage i think in le deuxième souffle uh, i'd read that he uh, you know, does the wallpaper in one of the rooms to match something he'd seen in a Robert Aldrich movie or, um, you know, uh, but uh, maybe I'm getting a little off the, the beaten path, but we're talking about a man who is, you know, has this very high esteem of himself, uh, is obsessed with American cinema and has an eye when he's watching movies like he may not have been trained. That's one of the things that's really key, I think, about the way that Melville operated to work as a filmmaker to work as a director in France you had to kind of pay your dues you had to start out at the bottom and work as an assistant and kind of you know learn at the feet of other people and in time you might be given a chance and Melville circumvented all of that he you know he uh kind of cut the line and and went straight to making the films outside of the system and uh, and yet it's clear that just as an audience member he would watch movies and absorb how they were made and he was learning on the job how to do it himself so by the time he gets to leon morin he's already got a few films under his belt and here i think you have a film that's incredibly nuanced and it's dealing with themes that are quite profound uh but uh Remy, did he ever explain to you I, i'm really curious like what it was about this piece of material, which I really think is exceptional in his career. It's really not like the other things in terms of its concerns. What was it, do you think, that drew him to the novel Léon Marin? Je voudrais qu'on traduise ta question, Peter. C'est uniquement, la question c'est, j'ai parlé assez longtemps, mais la question c'est court. Et c'est, c'était quoi qui a attiré Jean-Pierre, au roman, à la base, est-ce que c'était le, le relation entre le couple? Est-ce que c'était les questions de foi? Euh, est-ce qu'il y a... Oui, je comprends ce que tu veux dire. Je crois que c'est la transgression, à vrai dire. C'est-à-dire que Jean-Pierre était très, euh, très moraliste. Et il voyait à travers le roman, le roman, de Beck, il voyait la transgression. Ce qui l'intéressait, c'était la transgression. C'est-à-dire que, le, en principe, on ne tombe pas amoureux d'un prêtre, le prêtre euh, euh, ne tombe pas amoureux d'une femme, et ce qui l'intéressait, c'était ça, je pense. Je pense que ce qui l'intéressait le plus, c'était l'idée de la transgression dans le novel. And that was what <clears throat> what he wanted to portray in the film. And and there's there's different kinds of transgression here. There there is the 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 priest who has to refrain from being in love with a woman. There is a woman who has to refrain from being in love with a priest. And it's this type of transgression that was, I think, what drew him to the novel. I. Uh... Would you help uh, Ellen with, uh, Conrad has asked an interesting question, but my own French is not strong enough to to translate this for Remy's benefit, but I'd love to hear his, uh, if you're able to see in the chat. Um, um, hang on, let me see. 
Uh, or we can come back to it in a in a second. Oh no. Il y a des critiques qui parlent de Morin comme un saint. Pour moi, c'est un homme qui est entrapé uh, dans un système intellectuel conceptuel. Il a des réponses pour tout. Mais c'est son, son problème, c'est qu'il est absolument incapable de, de vraiment répondre à, à l'amour de Barney. Il lui donne un livre, Dogmatisme traditionnel et l'Empire critique. Uh, elle, uh, 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 à l'autre côté, est beaucoup plus un, une personne humaine et je, c'est beaucoup plus facile pour moi de m'identifier avec elle qu'avec Léon Morin. Oui, alors? <rire> c'est juste pour euh, nous, nous, euh, nous faire un peu en exploration des thèmes de, du film. Est-ce que... Ça, ça te dit quelque chose comme, euh, comme interprétation? Je ne comprends pas ta question, je ne comprends pas. L'interprétation, quelle interprétation? De, de, de l'observation de Con, Conrad. Euh, le, pour moi, j'ai une autre perception vis-à-vis le, le film, mais c'est intéressant l'idée que les deux sont... Il, il est peut-être intéressé par un système des règles qui est si rigide que ça pose une tragédie, que cette couple peut être ensemble, sauf c'est la religion, le dogma qui euh, c'est un peu la barrière. Est-ce oui. que c'était peut-être le cas? Où, euh... Oui, je pense que c'est, c'est ça que ça exprime. C'est-à-dire que... Enfin, il y a des choses qu'on peut faire, des choses qu'on ne peut pas faire. Et malheureusement, dans les choses qu'on ne peut pas faire, il faut les faire. Enfin, je veux dire, je m'exprime très mal. Mais ce que, ce que veut, on ne peut pas aller contre les choses qu'on doit faire. Je pense que c'est ça que pensait Jean-Pierre. Et il ne faut pas oublier que cet homme était, euh, a fait toute sa vie exactement ce qu'il a voulu. Il a dirigé sa vie dans le sens où il voulait la diriger. Euh, il a, enfin, je veux dire, depuis le début, depuis son enfance, ses parents voulaient, enfin, étaient, ça a insupporté ses parents qui se promènent avec une baby caméra euh, au lieu d'aller au lycée, euh, qui, qui leur amène des petits courts-métrages qui leur paraissaient ridicules alors que, euh, il avait gardé les... Je ne les ai pas vus, mais il avait gardé des bobines. Mais ça devait être bien. Euh, c'est, c'est un homme qui ne qui s'est rien refusé, Jean-Pierre. Qui, qui pensait qu'on ne devait rien se refuser. Et qui était, il, était, il a été toute sa vie hors marge. Il, a, c'est, il, avait, pas, il avait un caractère qui faisait qui croyait simplement qu'en lui, je pense, par rapport au monde, mais par rapport au, aux autres. Il était, euh, c'était un être qui était, on ne pouvait pas discuter avec lui parce qu'on avait l'impression qu'il avait toujours raison. I, I think what you say um, is correct. There are, the way he saw it is that there are things in life that you have to do. And that there are things that you do not have to do, that you should not have to do. But it is those particular things that you should not have to do that are the things that you should do. And I think this was really what his philosophy was. And it really relates a lot to his his philosophy of, uh, towards his own life. He really thought that one should do exactly what one wants to do. And in his own life, this is this is how he lived it. He directed his life in the direction that he wanted it to take, and he did this even as a as a young child. Um, and he would, you know, go around and he had his 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 little camera, his little movie camera, and he would take shorts, uh, little short films, um, and bring them back to to show to his parents, who thought this is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and I know that he kept those he kept those short films. I he had the film. I we ne- we never saw them, but we did have the the short films. And um, he refused himself nothing. 
what he wanted to do is what he did. And he was always somebody who was outside the edge. He was always like even just beyond being marginal. And he believed only in himself, I think. And one of the one of the things that was very difficult was to really have any kind of a discussion with him because if you were discussing something with him, you would always have the impression that he was absolutely right. Or that he felt he was absolutely right for sure, right? <laughs> you know, it sounds like... Uh... Uh, the, um, you know, my interpretation, the way that I fit Léon Morin into the oeuvre of uh, Jean-Pierre is the way that all of the films are united by codes, codes of honor, codes of moral and ethical, you know, the correct thing to do. And I see that exist in his criminal films. Sometimes it doesn't matter which side of the law you're on. What matters is how you behave vis-a-vis -vis your comrades in terms of like uh, maybe making uh, certain sacrifices that uh, that I wouldn't personally make in my life, but seem to be dictated by a higher kind of um, uh, rule book. And what higher rule book is there than that of religious dogma? So here you have you know, uh, uh, you have Melville exploring this idea of uh, there is a rigid code of instruction that's passed down through the church and certainly that governs a priest. And if uh, Belmondo's character, if Leon is committed to, uh, you know, his faith, then there's there no matter what comes along, uh, he can't uh, he can't veer from that. And here, what he's posed with is kind of the ultimate temptation is one word for it, but you know, just it's it's a, the ultimate challenge of his faith. And and he is uh, he does the thing that I think that Melville um, expects all of his characters to do which is, is he sacrifices maybe the thing that he would want or the easy route or the you know the pref the preference he might have for um for this higher um this higher dictate and maybe that's something that comes down to him from the military you know maybe it's something that was even if he was atheist maybe he was raised around religion and saw you know these things and questioned them himself but I do see this consistency throughout his filmography. Rami, I don't know. It's possible that everything I just said is a little tricky because of the English. But did you understand uh, sort of my interpretation? Uh, or would you like me to say it briefly in French? No, je suis d'accord uh, avec ton, ton interprétation. Je suis tout à fait d'accord. Qui est le... Sur le sixième et le cinquième écran, qui est le monsieur? Yeah. Uh, Conrad, you mean the one who asked the question? Oui, il y a, il y a mon écran, ton écran, l'écran de, de nos amis, mais qui est le monsieur sur le dernier écran? C'est un de nos invités uh, et c'est lui ah, qui a posé voilà. la question. Je me demandais qui c'était. Oui, oui, uh, uh, mais... Uh, le, nous avons une audience des gens virtuels. Voilà, là, comme c'est toujours le même visage, ça ne change pas, je voulais le savoir. Ah oui, oui. je ne sais pas si c'est les mêmes pour, pour vous. Conrad a une jolie peinture derrière son épaule. C'est lui que tu vois Sur non, ton épaule. <rire> je ne vois pas de peinture derrière, je vois une, une baie, une fenêtre. OK, je pense que tu quelqu'un d'autre, peut-être Roger ou uh, Roger. D'accord, uh, Simplement le, mais parce que... Nous avons un, un groupe de gens. OK. Voilà, je, voilà. C'est un monsieur qui nous écoute terriblement. Très bien, et je vais savoir qui c'était. Oui, sur euh, Léon Morin-Prêtre, je crois que c'était... Je veux dire, Jean-Pierre m'avait souvent raconté qu'il avait de grosses discussions avec son frère aîné, qui était donc mon père, avant la mort de mon père, évidemment, qui était avant-guerre, quand il était très jeune, sur l'existence de Dieu ou non. Mon père était athée. Jean-Pierre me disait, je ne savais pas si j'étais athée ou pas, et ça m'intéressait de qu'il m'explique. Et je pense que, à vrai dire, toute l'œuvre de Jean-Pierre, euh, croire ou ne pas croire en Dieu, c'est ça en fait partie, 
mais je crois que toute l'œuvre de Jean-Pierre, elle est basée réellement, j'ai déjà dit, je me redis, elle est basée sur le mensonge. Jean-Pierre avait horreur du mensonge, il estimait comme être cinéaste, on était obligé d'être dans le mensonge dans le mensonge, d'être menteur. Ça allait à l'encontre de lui-même et ça semblait bien le satisfaire, à vrai dire. I, I know that um, Jean-Pierre, when he was younger, he would have discussions with uh, his older brother, who was my father, um, and before the war, about... Um, did God exist? Because my, my father was an atheist and, and Jean-Pierre was not sure if he was an atheist or not. And so he was looking for an explanation. And these discussions that he had with, with, um, with his brother before were based around that. And I think that all of his work is really based on what I mentioned before, which is that um, he felt that all of cinema was based on lies. And in order to be a director, you had to be within that environment and to be operating in a world which was based on lies. And he had a horror of this. And so it was really something that that was uh, uh, an adjustment he had to make because of this conflict of horror of lying, but having to work within lies. Je vais vous montrer quelque chose que sure. j'ai... C'est la seule photo de mon père que j'ai, mais Jean-Pierre m'avait beaucoup parlé de mon père et il était euh, complètement admiratif de mon père. Je ne sais pas si vous pouvez la voir, je vous la montre. Je ne sais pas si on la voit à l'écran. Mm -hmm. I want to show you this. This is, this is one of the few photos that I have of my father um, and this was taken before the war. Et une partie, je pense que Jean-Pierre, qui avait admiré son frère, ça j'en suis certain, il a, il, a, il a toujours été partagé entre sa vie et la vie de ce que son frère aurait pu être s'il n'avait pas été tué pendant la guerre. Jean-Pierre really, really loved my father. And I think that his whole life was really divided between following his own life, but also focusing on what my father, his older brother's life could have been had he not died before the war. I, I wonder if it is something you could answer, but you know, because we're talking about personal things and because this movie, I feel like it's the rare movie, you know, he also write, he also did when you read this letter, quand tu liras cette lettre, that's a romance, but, um, You know, that deals often the women are are pushed to the margins of his movies or not so much pushed. He's focused on a world of men. But here we have him dealing with love. Given what you've described, sometimes men can be contradictory. <laughs> Humans can be contradictory. Was Melville a faithful husband, father? You know, uh, was, uh, you know, what kind of... Um, Uh, what was his relationship to the woman or women in his life? And how does that kind of compare to what we see um, uh, him depict on screen? Je... Go ahead, Remy. Oui, je... Les... je crois que les... Enfin... Les fa... Melville était très, très respectueux avec les femmes, très affable, très poli, très, très dévoué avec les femmes. Il, euh, il était, euh, je pense, enfin, les rapports qu'il avait avec sa femme étaient des rapports d'associés, ce qui n'avait rien à voir avec ce que je suis en train de vous dire. Mais quand il parlait des femmes, il était... Euh, il était, comment dire, il était un peu transfiguré. Il était, il était aimable, il était courtois. C'était, c'est un homme qui aimait les femmes. I think that Jean-Pierre was always someone who was very respectful towards women. He was very polite. He was really devoted to them. 
And <laughs> as far as the relationship he had with his own wife, she was more his partner, uh, which which is 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 something that's a little different from from what he, he was towards other women. But with other women, it's almost as if in his dealings with them, he was transfigured. He became very friendly. He became very courteous, very respectful towards them. And that was his attitude towards them. We're uh, we're reaching sort of the end of our time period, but I want to sort of point audiences in a, in a few directions with the time we have left. And of course, we will be back in a month to uh, to look at the next film in this series, which will be Le Cercle Rouge. But uh, you know, we can uh, we can talk since we were sort of speaking about Melville's connection to America and American cinema. There are two films he made, one before and one after Leo Morin, that are interesting. He went to New York to make a film called Two Men in Manhattan. Uh, if you're interested in seeing this film, it features a performance by Melville. He acts in the film. And uh, later in his third and final film with Belmondo, uh, not the final in his career, but the last in their partnership, and the one that co-starred Charles Vanel, uh, Magnet of Doom, which every once in a while pops up on the Criterion channel. It's an almost impossible film to find. So if you're ever in a position where you can see it, I highly recommend that you watch it during the little window that it's streaming or if there's a screening ever. But um, these two films are interesting because when you understand, as I think we've discussed today, that Melville is is uh, almost kind of fueled by this uh, inspiration of American culture, American cinema, the idea that he made two films. Uh, Remy, will you talk a little bit about each of these films? Let's start with Two Men in Manhattan, which I think is interesting for two reasons in particular. One, the way that jazz music features into the movie. And the other is the way that he made a movie that's set in Manhattan, but half of it was made in France and half of it was made on location. Pas compris la deuxième partie de la question. Alors, on parle de Two Men in Manhattan. Oui. Et les deux choses qui sont intéressantes pour moi, c'est le fait qu'il est accueilli aussi par le jazz. Ça, c'est un parti oui, du oui. film. Et l'autre, c'est le film qui se passe à Manhattan, mais c'est tourné moitié ou peut-être plus en France. Alors, il y a des extérieurs à, oui. à New York, oui, mais... Il y a une très, très, très bonne raison à ça, c'est que quand il est allé aux États-Unis, déjà, pour, euh, pour deux hommes dans, dans Manhattan, euh, il a fait le film dans lequel il joue et le rôle principal est presque tenu par son meilleur ami, qui, était, qui aurait voulu être acteur, mais qui n'était pas acteur. Et Jean-Pierre pensait qu'il aurait été très bon dedans. Sauf qu'en tournant, il s'est aperçu qu'il n'était pas vraiment très bon. Et quand ils sont partis aux États-Unis, euh, il n'arrivait il a, il a, il pas à vraiment, enfin je veux dire, il avait, il n'arrivait pas vraiment à, 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 à filmer euh, New York. Il avait du mal à filmer New York comme il voulait. En plus, il a eu des problèmes. Euh, euh, il tournait un petit peu comme il avait toujours fait toute sa vie en désespérado c'est-à-dire il n'avait pas d'autorisation il se faisait arrêter par la police euh, il fallait qu'il change d'endroit euh. donc ça a été compliqué et le, le, le personnage son meilleur ami donc dans la vie qui fait Delmas euh, j'ai un trou de mémoire là, je me souviens un peu comment il s'appelait euh, qui était qui était un beau mec en plus, qui aurait été formidable, mais qui n'a pas été bon. Il serait été formidable s'il avait été bon. Le film aurait peut-être été réussi. Mais Jean-Pierre s'est aperçu qu'il fallait qu'il, à la limite, qu'il tourne plus sur lui-même que sur l'autre. Donc, euh, c'était un fiasco, le voyage américain, pour le tournage. Un, un vrai fiasco. Et pour lui, ça a été une... Pour lui, c'est un film raté. Euh, euh, deux hommes. C'était le film qu'il avait envie de faire comme il avait travaillé quand il était jeune, un petit peu en marge, euh, avec des petits moyens, euh, 
caméra à la main. Et euh, alors, ce n'était pas deux cas qui, qui étaient à la caméra. C'était un type qui s'appelait, je crois, Sutter. C'était un Suisse qui était à la caméra et euh, qui était très bon, qui a sauvé beaucoup de coups, mais le film était raté pour Jean-Pierre. Ça n'a pas été un drame, mais ça a été euh, un regret. Ce film, c'est un regret. I think that um, one of the reasons why this film is 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 um, is important. First off, the the jazz music was something that he really did have a great love for. But I think that the reason why it was done in those two different locations was that he had envisaged um, one of the roles of the two men being played by his best friend. And it turned out that his best friend was not really very good. He was not very good as an actor and it didn't it didn't really it didn't really fulfill what Melville was looking for for that particular role. And when he came to New York and wanted to film in New York, he really had a hard time filming there. And part of the reason was he was filming the way he normally did, which was uh, desperado shooting, uh, which means no permits, no licenses. They had to change locations quite often. Uh, they were stopped and arrested by the police. So um, he really had to, to, to make a lot of quick changes doing that. And so um, the combination of the difficulties that they had in just filming it on, on location, and then also the fact that his best friend was not performing very well in the role, um, it, it turned out that the film was somebody who was not really, it was not really very good. Although the cinematographer who was a, a Swiss uh, cinematographer, I think his name was Sutter, um, actually was very good, but the film itself, he considered it um, a failure. And, um, you know, he he tried to do it the way he did when he was young, which was, you know, a film that was kind of on the margins, that was done with a very low budget, that was done with a handheld camera. And in this case, had his best friend been a good actor, it might have been a success, but unfortunately it wasn't. Well, that's practically all the time we have. I'll really quickly describe Magnet of Doom and just the, for the benefit of anyone who, for me, this was a holy grail for years and it finally showed up on the Criterion channel and it might come back from time to time. This is a film made in color later where he comes with Belmondo and Vanel and he shoots much more on location. And the film is kind of a road trip from the East Coast down to Louisiana. And there's even a detour. And I feel like this is probably the most Melvillian moment in the in the film where they go to see Sinatra's birth home, his, you know, his childhood home, which the characters are the ones looking, but I feel like this must have been, you know, just a hat tip by, by Melville and someone obsessed with American culture, wanting himself to go there and to share that with audiences. And in a way it feels like the whole road trip, while it has a narrative reason is really a chance for Melville to kind of, explore America himself and to go through these locations. But um, if you get a chance to see that in sometime down the road, uh, that's a that's a little gem. But we'll be back in a month. Uh, thank you for uh, excusing my sort of being a little disoriented at the beginning of this uh, session. But um, I, I think, we Remy, we've had a terrific conversation. I've learned things about Melville, and I feel like he's someone I know a lot about. Thank you for sharing your insights, and thank you to those of you who've joined us for this session today. Thank you, Peter. Merci beaucoup. Merci, thank you, Helen, for translating. Est-ce que tu peux rester à l'image de minutes, uh, s'il te plaît, Peter? De... Uh, oui. J'ai pas compris. Non, Peter, comment va mon ami, le présentateur français? Mon ami, le oui. présentateur oui. français, va-tu bien? Oui, oui, oui. Euh, je vais déjeuner avec maintenant et euh, bientôt on se revoit à Paris euh, en, bon. en décembre. Tu l'embrasses pour moi. Oui, je, je, je vais lui donner les euh, le tes souhaits. Merci. Oui. C'était un, un plaisir de, de rencontrer ton fils aussi euh, cette semaine. Euh, la ah, famille oui. est ici. Oui. Eh bien, rendez-vous à Paris. Oui, oui, bientôt. OK. À bientôt. Salut. Euh, merci, Ellen.
uh, for me that uh, <laughs> uh, I'll be back worry. next time. <laughs> Thanks. Last time I was a little overwhelmed trying to summarize, and you really got every beat of his answers. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.